Welcome to Aerial Mapping 101, Mapping Workflow for Beginners. And I'm just going to get the party started and turn it right over to Aaron. So take it away. Thanks so much, Kerry. And welcome, everybody, to this week's installment. This week, we're going to talk about Drone Mapping 101. This is going to be kind of a higher level overview of how to get involved with mapping or creating maps, if you will, with your drones or aerial photography. And so let's go ahead and just get this kicked off here today. I do believe that today I'm looking for a little bit more audience participation than we've had in the past. And so please feel free to enter in any questions you have into the question or the chat area here, and we'll do our very best to address those as we're going through the presentation. All right, I've got a little poll writing at the moment, uh, just kind of getting what people's experience levels are. So we'll go ahead and give this another few seconds here to let people get their votes in so we kind of know who we're talking to. That looks like uh, almost 40% of the people don't have any mapping experience. 25% have a little and they want to learn more. 30% uh, of the people have some experience and 5% have a lot of experience. And so far, nobody is here just for job credits. So that's good. So, <laughs> all right, that kind of wraps. I think we got pretty much everybody and uh, all right, back to you, Aaron. Thanks, Carrie. So what, the topics we want to talk about today are just generally the outline, if you will, on what it takes to do a successful drone mapping mission. And so the graphic you see here on the screen showing both the map and a globe kind of gives you an impression or gives an idea of what it is we're getting into here. And we want to focus on the mapping component of things, which would be the standard paper kind of map document here versus the right hand, that globe. That'd be more of what I'll call a 3D model. And in this case here, we're focused on trying to create a orthomosaic top-down view of the world or a 2D kind of orthomosaic map, and that'll be our end goal for this. And so whenever you're getting ready to make a top-down map, one of the first things you want to think about is what is like your project extent, what's the area that you're trying to map. We're going to talk a little bit about project resolution or your GSD. Then we'll talk about the deliverables you can get out of PIX4D and what those elements are, those items. Then we'll talk a little bit about the field logistics, what you want to do about checking for airspace. Power considerations is always a big issue in the field. Then we'll talk briefly on GCP and scale, and then also data check in the field and show some examples from a, a data processing I did just recently. So I've shown a graphic similar to this before, and one of the primary concerns when you're capturing a project is make sure you capture enough imagery to gather, to represent the entire area you're trying to map. And I'm as guilty as this as anybody. When I go out to a location, it's like, okay, I'm trying to map out this area. I typically end up trying to draw my polygon right at the area I'm looking to map. And you always want to make sure you tr draw that polygon or the mapping area in excess or slightly proud of the area it is you're looking to map. And that's because typically with the structure from motion kind of processing algorithm that most drone photogrammetry softwares use, if you don't have additional data beyond the edge of the project area you're trying to map, the data right along the edge of your project will be somewhat questionable or not as robust because it's not being supported or reinforced by data outside of the project area itself. So as the graphic here shows, it's important to capture an area more than just the project area, with the gray blob in the center of the map here or the scene being the primary project area. You see we have one flight line in excess going all the way around of additional data. That way we have good coverage for all the area that we're trying to map. And then the front and the side overlap that you choose for your project will somewhat depend on the terrain and the ground cover, and we'll get into that next. And so another key criteria to keep in mind when you're trying to do a mapping mission is something called the ground sampling distance, or the GSD. And this is a little bit counterintuitive because typically you think with a big GSD you're getting maybe better data. But actually, a big GSD or a large ground sampling distance equals or is equivalent to a lower sampling resolution and lower quality output. And so you as a pilot in command really only have control over one element in the, um, the math function that determines what your ground sampling distance size is. And the components that go into that have to do with your camera focal length, the size of your sensor, and then also the size, like the pixels on that sensor, and the altitude with which you fly. And so typically, since most pilots can't change the camera on their drone, you as the pilot in command have the ability to control how high you're flying 
and that will ultimately then dictate what your ground sampling distance is going to be. And so the good folks at PIX4D have come up with this really handy, what we'll call ground sampling distance or GSD calculator. And this calculator is something that if you follow the QR code that I have up here on the screen, and I also have at the bottom of the screen the actual full link, and if you just go out to Google and type PIX4D GSD calculator, it'll take you out to this site here. And there's information here on the, in the GSD calculator where you as a user enter in your sensor width, the focal length of your camera, the flight height in meters that you anticipate flying, the image width, and then the image height in pixels. And the software will then report back what the average ground sampling distance in centimeters per pixel would be for that and also gives you information on the width of a single image or the footprint of that image on the ground and the height of that image. And those last two bits of information are really important because it can help you to determine what your overlap distances or frequency to capture additional images to achieve the overlap you're looking for is if perhaps you're using a camera that's not supported by automatic flight planning software like PIX4D Capture or DJI Pilot those applications will intrinsically already tell you what your ground sampling distance will be for any given height, but this ground sampling distance calculator provides handy information if you're trying to use maybe a terrestrial-based camera or a camera that's not already built into the, the existing databases. And so when you're going to then start planning for your mission and how you want to capture your overlap, it's really important to take into consideration what kind of topography or the layout of the area it is you're trying to map it's very common to, like, not every project area you're going to map is going to be a flat, open parking lot or a field. Often a project area might have changes in topography or topology across the area. Perhaps like in the graphic you see here on the screen, there's a hill on the project area, or perhaps there's some tall trees or a building or something like that. And so it's really important to keep in mind that if possible, as I as it noted here, to try to plan and take off from the highest point in the project area to avoid overlap breakdown over higher ground. So in the example you see here on the screen, you can see if you were to take off from like the left-hand portion of the screen here where the first drone area is, and say you're telling the drone to fly up to say 100 feet in altitude and to start capturing images with say 60 or 70% overlap, we can see here the cone that's being shown shows how we're getting a little bit of overlap here. Perhaps we need to increase the amount of overlap actually here. But as the drone then flies over the hill where the hill then comes up closer, we can see that the footprints on the ground are much smaller and now we're not getting any overlap at all. And that's really one of the primary issues that folks just getting into mapping will run into that if they're trying to map out say a farm or a property or something like that, the areas that are grass and green and open will reconstruct just fine, but you'll get to a taller building, maybe a barn or some trees or something like that, and that part of your model won't reconstruct well, and that's because you're not getting enough overlap of what the data is seeing at the top of the trees, and those areas just can't reconstruct then. And so you can help to avoid that kind of issue by first taking off at a higher point within your project. That way, if you're taking it at a higher point, when the drone moves out over an area that is now at a lower altitude, your image overlap will actually increase rather than decrease, and you'll still get a good satisfactory result at the end. This is another graphic here to kind of reinforce that same point because really the data capture side of things is where you as the pilot in command have the most control over the end output quality, garbage in, garbage out. So you want to make sure you're getting good quality images with sufficient overlap. We can see here on this first example that if you're flying at, say, roughly 300 feet from takeoff and you have like 60% front and side overlap, the graphic down below here shows that in the center part of the area, you'll get really good overlap where more than four images will capture that one particular area on the ground, and you'll get a good orthomosaic stitch at the end. But then if all of a sudden you have maybe some stockpiles or some things that have bumps to them, that amount of overlap that you had previously of 60% front side now becomes maybe 50% over that stockpile itself, and you're getting a much smaller area here that has sufficient images and gets good stitching, and that can, can be pounded further if you have then maybe a large hill here or something like that, you're, and you're getting less overlap and less reconstruction, and then to the very far extreme where because of the height changes and tall objects, you're not really getting enough overlap at all. And so when you're doing drone mapping and modeling, it's always best to what I'll say, err on the side of caution 
and capture more than what you need because it's certainly possible to take images out of a data set and maybe just process every other image. But if you don't have the data to begin with, you can't just pull an image out of thin air, if you will. And so PIX4D recommends that you capture overlap in a project of roughly 75% front overlap and 60% side. I like to take that a little bit further because one of the benefits of drone mapping and modeling is the cost reduction over using full-size aircraft. And because the cost of each individual photo is rather small, if really not insignificant at all, so just capturing more images, and I like to fly mine with 80% front and 80% side overlap. And having that higher percentage of overlap really helps to accommodate for instances where there are taller objects or changes in elevation, and it really helps prevent getting holes in your data that way. And I find that typically works best. And once again, this is focused on for mapping output, not necessarily a 3D modeling output. If you were doing more of a 3D modeling, you might need to get down and take quite a bit of oblique images in addition to the nadir images. And so here, our focus today is just top-down mapping or orthomosaic creation. And so really 80% front and side is more than enough for that typically. And so once we've kind of talked about sort of the altitudes we want to fly and the um, ground sampling distance we're trying to achieve, let's think briefly about the project deliverables that we're going to be providing out of PIX4D. We can see here on the screen a list of each of the pr um, product deliverables we can create. The first item we get, of course, is the color, dense color point cloud or that LAS file that's generated during step two. You can also get a classified point cloud or the software will go through and classify that colored point cloud as either ground, road surface, human-made objects, high vegetation, or roads, road service, I think it was, that's all five. And that can help benefit in map creation. But really the products we're looking for for mapping are going to be the orthomosaic, which is a 2D image map geometrically corrected such that the um, any kind of perspective distortion has been removed and the scale is uniform across from it. You can also create contour lines and essentially, the contour lines would just be lines connecting points of equal or equivalent elevation across your project, those kind of topo lines you may become familiar with. Then you can also create items called the digital terrain model, or DTM, and a digital surface model. These are both geo -tiffs and our 2D kind of outputs, or 2.5D really. And then a reflectance map and a 3D texture map. But our primary focus here today is going to be the orthomosaic because that's really the fundamental map that it, we're going to be creating. And so really, when you get right down to it, what is a map? And so a map is a representation, usually on a plane surface, of all or parts of the, maybe this one here so you can see my screen a little better, a part of the Earth or some other body showing a group of features in terms of their size and position. You can also have a map defined as text, essentially, or maps have character of being textual in that they have words associated with them and employ a system of symbols within their own syntax that they function as a form of writing. And so I, a map to different kinds of people can mean different kinds of things in some instances, and a lot of folks argue about what really makes up a map. And so when we get down to it, let's talk about a map or a picture briefly, and really what's the difference between a map and a picture? As nouns go, the difference between a map and a picture is that a map is a visual representation of an area, whereas a real, whether real or imaginary, while a picture is a representation of really anything. And when we look at the graphic we have here on the right, this shows both an orthographic view and a perspective view of a particular location. And what we're trying to do here with creating an orthomosaic is removing perspective distortion. So we can see in the orthographic view you see these two polygons or squares from a top-down perspective, and you can do very accurate measurements from the corner of one square to the corner of the other and get a distance there. Whereas with our perspective view, we can see that the point of perspective is the black dot kind of in the center, and so we're getting this perspective distortion such that we're seeing the side of the square here and then the side of the square here, and if we do a measurement between the corner here and the corner there, we may not actually get an accurate measurement where we will out of the orthographic view. And so as an example of that, here this is an example I've shown in a previous um, webinar, but this is a project I did at a nearby school facility here. 
And we can see here on the left, we have an orthomosaic view, whereas on the right, we have just a single air photo that was captured. So on this air photo that was captured here on the right, in the upper left-hand corner, we can see this area here where you get a good bit of the facade or the side of this upper building here. And then also there's an area over here on the right where you can also see the facade on this right-hand building. And then the last really noticeable item here is the sidewalk off to the end of this top gray building here at the bottom. We can see in the perspective view where the perspective distortion, or I'm sorry, the orthomosaic view where perspective distortion has been removed. Here in this upper left-hand corner, you clearly see just the top of the building goes straight down to the sidewalk. You're not getting any of the side of the building. Just as over here, you're not getting, at the very bottom of the scene, you're not getting the building leaning over the sidewalk, covering up a good portion of the sidewalk like it's happening in the image. It's all been orthorectified, and you can do accurate measurements in the X and Y orientation and get proper distances. And that's ultimately what we're trying to create with PIX4D or whatever other photogrammetry processing so software you might be using. We're trying to take these images that are captured by the drone that each contain perspective distortion along the edges, if you will, and merge those all in together to create one true and accurate orthomosaic image. And so to do that here, let's also just briefly talk about the seven elements of a map. And so just to sort of talk about things that typically exist on a map, we see here on the graphic on the right, this is more of a traditional map versus a, a drone map maybe. But we can see that the primary, the first element is of course the data frame itself where our map will ultimately live. Then to me, maps also would have a legend or something that would be a symbol reference for the unknown unique symbols shown on the map. You should also of course have a title for your map to provide information as far as like keywords that grab the reader's attention and can help convey who, what, when, where, maybe why this map's happening or is being made. Then of course, for it to truly be a map, you need to have some type of direction on the, the document, such as a compass rose or a north arrow. Then you also want to have some kind of a distance or scale measurement capability. And so these distances could be perhaps maybe textual, where you have like one inch equals a mile, or one to 22,000 or some 24,000 or something like that. But the most helpful type of representation is a graphical scale. And the graphical scale, like a scale bar, is really best to put onto a map because if for some reason you were to resize this document, grabbing it in the corner and stretching it, if you will, you'll also stretch that scale bar such that it'll stay relative to the project. Whereas if you put an inch to a mile, one inch is one mile, and then you stretch your map, it'll still say one inch to one mile, but at that point in time, it would no longer be true. So having a scale bar is usually the most helpful. And then the last item would be a grid or an index, and that helps the map viewer find the location. And here we can see that they have a map inset showing where in California this particular fire story was taken from down here in Southern California. And so these would be elements to a map. And really many of these items are not created directly by the photogrammetry software itself. The photogrammetry software will take the drone imagery and process and create data that you would ultimately put into a data frame of a mapping software where you'd also add a legend and a title, et cetera. But what you're going to get directly out of PIX4D is really just going to be that orthomosaic or geotiff that you'll then turn into a map. And so when we're getting ready to go out into the field and capture data, it'd be outside of the realm of what we can really cover here adequately within one hour to talk about airspace logistics and things such as that. So I'm going to keep it just very brief here today and say that it's critical that you always follow local, state, and federal rules and guidelines whenever planning and conducting drone flights for mapping operations. But keep in mind also that when you can operate it, we'll say the highest allowable above ground elevation or AGL. Here in the US, typically that would be 400 feet AGL would be the legal flight altitude with which you can typically fly unless you're in some kind of controlled airspace that would have a lower altitude. And so by flying at the highest altitude, you're able to legally fly that will ultimately reduce the amount of time you have to spend in the field capturing data and also ultimately back in the office processing the data. You do have the trade-off that the higher you fly, the lower your ground sampling distance will be, or I'm sorry, the higher your ground sampling distance will be such that high ground sampling distance will be lower resolution. 
but you don't always, not every customer needs to have one centimeter ground sampling distance for their ultimate image. Think about ultimately how you plan to use your document or your data, because if you're going to be printing a document out on, say, eight and a half by 11 paper, certainly having six inch pixel size is, would be equivalent to having one inch pixel size if you're trying to put an entire project area on just a small piece of paper. So you don't always have to have things super high res. Always go out and check with the various resources, whether it be before you fly or air map, et cetera. Just make sure you always have lance clearance for any kind of drone mapping operation. And then another thing to keep in mind is that the thing that has been the biggest constraint on folks out in the field mapping is actually do, um, battery conservation or energy, if you will. And there's a lot of different components that you're dealing with out in the field that you need to worry about battery energy for. Of course, you have your primary one, the drone flight batteries. And as I've mentioned before, I like to make sure that my flights aren't planned to consume the entire battery, if you will. I like to land my drone when I have at least a 20% battery threshold left. If you push your batteries beyond that 80% or down to 20% on a regular basis, you will ultimately shorten the lifespan of those batteries. But in addition to the flight batteries, you also have to worry about your controller battery. Certainly a controller will typically last through multiple flights. But using a controller after like the fifth or sixth flight, you might find that it's time that you do need to recharge that and have access to some way to perhaps provide more power to your controller. And then really one of the biggest limiting agents is the, feet, the mobile device itself. If you don't have a smart controller type device with a built-in screen, you'll need to leverage your own tablet or mobile device in some way to help provide an interface for the drone while you're flying. And so having the ability to um, charge in or maybe even swap out mobile devices every five or six missions could be um, critical or very helpful. And then it's always helpful, I believe, if you take a field computer out with you or something that you can do a quick field inspection of all your imagery prior to processing. And then last but not least, don't forget about the actual pilot battery itself. After flying five or six missions, it's good for the pilot to be able to have a break, if you will, and not run them ragged. So you always want to make sure you're keeping in mind what kind of power you'll need you'll need out in the field. Here at Multicopter Warehouse, we have a wonderful product from Energen that allows you to recharge batteries in the field or also field computers and mobile devices. But any kind of generator or electrical outlet you might have access to can also serve that purpose just as well. And then another thing to keep in mind is ultimately what kind of accuracy does your project require or is called for? If you need to have something with both high global and relative accuracy, that means the points you have have very high accuracy on a global scale so they can be put into, a, say, a GIS or a geographic information system and compared with other data, then in that kind of case, you'll definitely want to be using ground control points or GCPs. And that itself is a whole topic for another day. We can talk about GCPs. I'm happy to address questions that people may have about those. But for most projects, you can really get by with just having what we'll call a known scale reference. And the example I show here are these sky rulers by a company called Hoodman that makes these handy little items that are these black and orange tiles that snap together. And this sky ruler, each tile is one foot long, so you get a five foot length there. And this is a handy item I like to put down on many of my projects. Just as a quick field check, that as I'm coming back in and I start to process my images, I can do a measurement of this known distance in my model and quickly validate that, oh, I'm getting five or 5.01 feet for this, and that gives me good confidence that I'm getting good measurements across the rest of my model. Because ultimately, maybe I don't need a high degree of global accuracy, I just require a high degree of relative accuracy. And that would mean that if I make a measurement on the ground, that my measurement will be accurate, but ultimately my XYZ position for real world coordinates could be shifted by a few meters. And that's okay as long as I'm still getting those relative accuracy measurements. And you can certainly achieve that with just a sky ruler and not needing to do a whole bunch of ground control points and doing all that extra work. And so once you've captured your data, it's important to do an image inspection. And I encourage both like doing an inspection of the data right off the SD card. You can review that from the drone when it comes back and lands, just kind of thumb through the images very quickly to see if they're good. And then also doing a rapid field processing of step one is highly encouraged. And I have some example data sets I can show with you that I did mapping this past um, weekend here on some free time. And I didn't follow my own advice and I failed to do a image inspection at the end of this because I had a, another commitment that I needed to get back home for. 
And at that point in time, I didn't really have time. And lo and behold, when I got back to the, um, to the computer and got to processing, I found that I didn't actually get all the images I'd wished for that day in the field. And if I had followed my own advice and had done an image inspection, that wouldn't have happened. So let's go ahead and take a moment here and show you kind of an example of one of my most recent mapping projects. So I'm going to kick out of here and go into Pix4D itself. Or actually, let's go into um, an option I hear called the single grid that I've uploaded to the Pix4D cloud already. And so let's see here, let me turn off my digital surface model. <clears throat> this is an area here just of a local city park that I went out. And in this example here, the title um, indicates it's called Single Grid 456. And that was the single grid data flight that I processed in Pix4D 456. And in this instance here, you can see at the ortho mosaic that I created from this, there are some black holes here right along the edge of areas that didn't really reconstruct well in my ortho mosaic. And that's because this was just a quick single grid of data. And whenever you have a single grid, you'll kind of end up with some data holes on the edge here. If I switch over into Pix4D Mapper, we can actually see here, you get the same results if you process it on the desktop kind of environment. We zoom in here, we can see those are just some kind of weird holes that happen along the edge of the project. But once again, hopefully that's outside of the area that I was looking to map. I have a, sing a similar data set that I captured in a double grid kind of a format. And having a double grid option really helped cut down on those holes there because you, they have data slightly in excess of your project, more so, if you will. And I can see I just end up with a, a neater edge to my project by capturing additional data with that double grid approach. And then let's see here, we actually step back out here and we can look at the map view for just a moment. Here in the map view, you can see on this screen here where each of my red dots were. And so you can see I did one initial flight in a north-south kind of pattern in a single grid. And then I also have a east-west pattern here that I did in a slightly reduced footprint or project area. But by having data in excess of my project area, when we look at the ortho mosaic, I see that I have very good clean edges along my project. Whereas when I step out and I look at one of my projects where I didn't have that extra data, I can see you have some small holes and things like that along the edge of your project. And I like to try to avoid those kind of items in my projects, if you will. And then if we look here at one more time at what we see here in the cloud, you get the same results from Pix4D Cloud, but sometimes it's a little bit more challenging to visualize the results, if you will. So if I turn on my digital surface model for this particular area here, let's turn off my ortho mosaic, we can see here that certainly it indicates very clearly where the trees are, but I'm not getting much information on really what the lay of the land is here. And that has to do with just the way data is visualized in the cloud. If we look at the Pix4D Mapper desktop data itself, I can actually come up here and now turn on my digital surface model within my mosaic editor. And I can see here what I was really looking for at was this um, catchment pond or this holding area that was built within the park here. And here in the digital surface model shown within Pix4D desktop, you can really clearly make out the contour, if you will, here or the depression that's meant to hold that and even the finer details here that are the inlet and the outlet here, if you will, and we switch back to the mosaic, you see those kind of very fine features, whereas the representation within Pix4D Cloud, if we look at that, if we come in here, we can see that it just doesn't get really represented quite the same way. You don't have the same granular kind of control on how things display within the cloud, but you ultimately get the same type of data. And so if I were to export this data from the cloud, I could then loaded into QGIS or some other third-party software and then finish or make that completed map. And so I also did a quick example or test to see how these product, these same image data sets would process if I used them in Pix4D React versus the standard Pix4D mapper. And so here we can see this data set and just as a quick field check here is relative accuracy this project did not have any ground control points established in it, but if I zoom in down here, we can see this was the picnic table I set up on here, and I had a, um, <coughs> a drone landing pad, if you will, that I was using here on the, on the ground for my drone to take off and land from, and the measurement on that landing pad was 41 inches along the width here, and so I did a quick um, measurement check within the Pix4D cloud, and I can do another one on the other side here, just kind of essentially zoom in here. It's still loading up. The imagery looks better than that. We're getting a slow cloud connection right here today. But if I measure from one side to the other, 
I can still see that right about there. Yeah. Hey, Aaron. Eric's asking, yes, how do you set up a processing area to show straight lines in final output? That's a great question. And that's something you can't do directly within Pix4D Cloud itself. That's something I did in Mapper. So within the Mapper interface right here, we kind of zoom out here. We can see in this instance here that I have sort of some lines defined here. And you do that within what they call the Ray Cloud interface. I've created a processing area. And so the processing area can be either, well, in this case, if I want to just remove or delete that one, you can see some other data fills back in around it. But I can create a new processing area by using the icon in the upper left-hand corner here that says New Processing Area. And whenever you draw something within Pix4D, you merely move your mouse somewhere, and you left-click to start drawing, move your mouse, left-click to add a vertex, move my mouse, left-click, left-click. And when I'm done drawing my, mouse, drawing my vertices, I right-click to complete. And in this case here, then the software has created that processing area. And now any data that I create or generate following the creation of that processing area will respect that processing area and will have be clipped to my final to that output border. But that's a great question. Thanks for sharing that or asking, Carrie. And so yeah, are there are there other questions about mapping 101? I, it's hard to really cover everything about mapping in just one hour. But at the same point in time, really most of the hard work for planning a mapping mission is really at the, at the front end of it, if you will, of planning it. Once you add all your images into Pix4D and hit start, I've not had to do any additional processing on this data set. I added my images and I hit go. And I still got very good relative accuracy. If we zoom in here, we can see that the measurement that I got here for that polyline came out to be, I believe here it shows here on the right, that I got a 3.29 meters or I'm not sorry, 3.29 feet. And so that's just a little bit over three feet, or in this case, it should be 41 inches in length. And I believe 3.29 comes in pretty close there to <clears throat> 41. I don't have the exact math calculation here in front of me. But if I go back out to the cloud interface here briefly, we can see here on the cloud, I have done a little bit of math, inter math already. And if I click here on the landing pad, it's supposed to be 40 inches wide. Here I got 3.412 and the same measurement as the double grid as the double grid option, and that really came out to be, be, I believe, about 39 inches. And so very, very close to what I was looking for there without having to spend a whole lot of time doing ground control points to have the full robust geo-referencing of the project. As some of you folks have started to get into mapping, are there any um, general questions that you've kind of had that you were unsure of kind of where to begin that perhaps something that I glazed over during the mission planning component or something there that I might be of help with the folks? No questions or chat options here yep. coming in? How many batteries did the park map take? This park map battery, this was just one quick one quick mission. And I think here, if I go back out to my files here for my single grid collection of this, it was only 80 images that were captured. So this was really a rel relatively quick flight. I think it was only about 15 minutes, and I did this one here with the Autel Evo 6 or Autel Evo 2 Pro 6K, and it has a 40 minute battery. And so, yeah, I did this first mission on one battery, I swapped out, and then I was planning on doing a double grid mission. And unfortunately, during the double grid mission, I hadn't checked the SD card, my SD card had filled up, and long story short, I didn't end up with all the images I anticipated. And so I didn't quite capture all the data there. I was looking for if we come back out and look at our single grid or our both option here, we can still see that even with like the double grid data that I was able to collect for the few lines helped out and really got a, a nice clean model, if you will, here. If we zoom in, we can see we still got that same measurement of 3.412 feet for my landing point, landing pad that was 40 or 41 inches. And so right in line with what I was looking for there. And you can also see good quality and clarity on like the playground equipment itself here. If we turn off our ortho mosaic and we see what the traditional data look like behind it, certainly you can see from it the, the outlines and the basic element of what's going on. But the quality of the ortho mosaic created by the drones, much higher quality such that if you zoom in here, you can almost make out the details of the little rock climbing steps up to the top of the slide there that you just can't really see at all in the native um, publicly available data that's avail available for that location. And so in this case here, the geo tip that I've created within Pix4D is say like a, 
a good quality and I can simply go into the download option and at this point here I can simply go down and export out my ortho mosaic here and all the all these items and then open them up in QGIS or another third-party software to create a finished map and just like that then you've created a, a custom map for a particular location. Okay. And so, uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, I mean, are you, are you, there's, we've got a bunch of questions here. Okay, good. You should be able to see them in, as well. Oh, okay, I see, I see one question. I always see if I can adjust my screen over here. I apologize. Uh, do you have any recommendations for platforms that can add legends, distances, titles, et cetera? Oh, uh, yes. So my recommendation for that would be software called QGIS or QGIS. Q, and that's free shareware software. The cost is nothing really. And you can download that. And I'll be doing a future webinar more in depth about how you get into QGIS and how you import the imagery there and how you can make the whole finished map. And that'll be for a future week. I just haven't had a chance to get that going yet. I apologize. So let's see. I see some questions here now. Okay. Uh, processing alternatives. Pix4D is a bit rich. Uh, yeah, I mean, to get started, I often recommend Maps Made Easy because you kind of pay per acre versus a subscription model. So that's going to be the the kind of the entry level price point is Maps Made Easy, and then Drone Deploy and Pix4D are going to be your your uh, higher end products. That uh, at some point, if you're doing a lot of mapping missions, it's going to be more cost effective to move into Pix4D than to continue using. Maps Made Easy, but Maps Made Easy is great on the low end. I, I did a 42-acre uh, crime scene for the sheriff's department. It cost 16 bucks. And since I do like one paid mapping mission in my entire life, why keep a, a big subscription for something? Um, best drones yeah. for mapping? Another option um, that I like is measure.com. Um, I like measure.com yep. as an option. They, that's using the PIX4D algorithm as well. If you happen to be associated with a municipality that has access to what we'll call ESRI or ArcGIS, they have a solution called drone to map that is essentially the same algorithm as PIX4D also. And then there is an option called Open Drone Map or ODM that is essentially a free um, drone mapping software. And I'll be um, exploring that some more here in the near future to, to communicate with folks about but that would be another option. But really, I, Pix4D does offer two-week free trial licenses that have full capabilities with no restrictions whatsoever. And so really, if this is something that looks attractive or interesting to you, I encourage you to investigate the free license from Pix4D. We can get you one of those here through Multicopter Warehouse if you reach out to us. Or also, you can reach directly to Pix4D and after a, yeah, a free trial or two, see that there is economic value here for your customers. And really, with just one or one project, you can justify the, the cost of a, a PIX4D license, I believe. Yeah. Uh, Greg's asking the best drones for mapping. And that's going to be, uh, I mean, if you want best, that's typically going to be a camera that has a mechanical shutter, which is going to be the Phantom 4 Pro or uh, the. Matrice series or the Matrice 200 with the X7 camera that can carry that has a mechanical shutter. There's going to be options coming uh, soon for the Matrice 300 that will make it an amazing mapping platform. But honestly, uh, Aaron has done some really good maps just manually taking pictures with a Spark. So you prefer something that can be automated, you know, that can do automated mapping missions with like Pix4D capture or something that's built in like DJI pilot but um, you know higher resolution the better and um, that's kind of a, a good go-to there yeah and so I just brought up here this is a 3d model of an m300 drone I created a couple weeks ago using pix4d catch which is a new mobile application pix4d recently announced that works on a mobile device I did this with an iPad Pro and so just walking around with the iPad here, I was able to create a 3D model and then upload that or with Pix4D or with Pix4D Cloud, process the images captured just from a, a handheld iPad, essentially, and create a very accurate 3D model of the um, M300 that was, as it was sitting on a drone landing pad. So it's not always about using a drone. 
Certainly the drone allows you to get the camera into the location to get the best optical optional picture for location, but really you can do 3D mapping and modeling with any kind of digital camera. Uh, um, how often do you take a picture? I have no experience with this. So really with the pictures, um, if you're doing an automated flight plan, the grid approach, if you will, that you can do with DJI Pilot or DJI Go 4, or actually not Go 4, I'm sorry, DJI Pilot or Ground Station Pro, et cetera, allows you to uh, get knows the camera specific, so you just tell it the percentage of overlap and it makes that happen. But if you're trying to do just a rule of thumb, if you will, better to over photograph than under photograph. And so if you take a photo essentially and then take a step and then take a photo, that works for terrestrial projects or for an aerial project. If you bring on what I'll call your rule of thirds grid that you can bring on to your display, kind of dividing your screen up into a little tic-tac-toe field, if you capture an image as something appears at the top of your screen, the data will then kind of proceed down your screen as you fly your drone forward. Snap another photo as that element that you photographed at the top of your screen gets to that first line. Then again, as it gets to the second line of the tic-tac-toe, and then a fourth photo right before it drops off your screen, and you'll have essentially achieved that 70% overlap and have a good reconstruction. And what does Pix4D work with Skydio too? When is your next webinar that would cover how to capture and create volumetric reports? We touched a little bit on volumetric reports previously. Pix4D capture does not support the Skydio 2 currently, but the Skydio 2 does have, I believe, its own built-in flight planning software, if you will, that you can process the data from the Skydio 2 with Pix4D Mapper, but I, it's not currently supported by Pix4D Capture. Do we need a, a quarry client to be able to, uh, need it, need for a new quarry client to deliver multi stock power reports? Um, yeah, uh, if you have questions on the P4P stockpile reports, reach out to me individually. I'm happy to help address those if it's something you need right away, or else we can have a volumetric conversation in the near future. What is the cost of PIX4D? That's a great question. If you go to the PIX4D website, you can get PIX4D Mapper on a monthly basis for $350. You can rent it on an annual basis for $3,500, or you can purchase it outright with what we'll call a perpetual license for $4,990. Not the cheapest, but if you also purchase that license in conjunction with a drone from us here at Multicopter Warehouse, we can extend you a 10% discount off of those prices I just mentioned, and also happy to help people with um, support on getting up to speed on your mapping missions. Does Pix4D do train following for some surveys that take videos, not photos? And so unfortunately, the Pix4D capture application is not what we'll call Z-aware, or there's no train following built into that. <coughs> um, MapPilot, I believe, and Lychee, there are a couple different applications that do allow for that. But for the most part, Pix4D capture does not do that. I am certainly, there's um, the, what is it? Uh, Mo E-Motion's flight planning software for the SenseFly EB, that, that software has elevation data kind of built into it, if you will, but you don't necessarily need that. I mean, if you want, you could fly a mission very quickly with PIX4D at 400 feet, create a very coarse digital train model, and then use that to help plan a future mission, but it's not something really built into the PIX4D capture software currently. These programs mentioned use only the photos taken by the drone, or is there additional hardware that needs to be added to the drone? No, these are all, well, yeah, these are all just images directly from, from the drone. There's no additional hardware that needs to be added to it. I've actually successfully mapped and modeled, if you will, with a DJI Rizo Tello drone, the $100, I think, 10 or 5 megapixel kind of image drone. And so really, you don't have to use a drone at all. This can work with cell phone images. DSLR images, mirrorless kind of camera images, as long as you have good overlap among your images, you can get a good quality result. Is the Mavic 2 Pro sufficient for mapping? And so the Mavic 2 Pro, not to be confused with the Mavic 2 Zoom, Mavic 2 Pro, the 20 megapixel variety is actually a, a pretty good mapping camera. I don't think it's quite as good as the Phantom or the Phantom 4 Pro version 2, but ultimately the Mavic 2 Pro with that 20 megapixel Hasselblad sensor will work sufficiently and folks get good quality results with that. Zoom cameras are not optimal because a zoom has a variable focal length and you want to have a fixed focal length for mapping purposes, so I would avoid any kind of a zoom camera when possible. I'm just starting out, what software is the best balance between price, 
and probably performance. Apple App Store has two prices for the app, $9.99 and $49.99 for the business. I don't, one I don't know what you're talking other. about there. Um, so he's talking about here, it. actually, Map Pilot. There's a Map Pilot free or basic edition, and there's a Map Pilot business edition. And so the Map Pilot business edition has the ability to do some more project sharing, if you will, <laughs> as far as one person planning a project and sharing it with other people to execute. So some functionalities like that might be helpful. But you may find that just the 999 version is sufficient. And really, I, for the most part, I wouldn't worry about trying to use one of those applications right away. I'd really the free software that's available directly from DJI, their Ground Station Pro, I believe it's called, works fine. Or also Pix40 Capture or Capture or the DJI Pilot app. There's really not a need to go out and buy a paid flight planning app right out off the bat. I wouldn't. I would discourage that right away. Absolutely. Are there any totally interest limits with the 4999 limit Pix40 subscription? So actually that 499 lifetime it's not really a subscription at that point in time. You you've purchased the software software and you own it outright and so you can process as much on your own local computer as you want. And so and you will be limited by hardware capabilities that you have if you will. But I, for the most part, you aren't limited on the number of project, number of images. I have heard that once you get up to about 10,000 images in a project, that there can start to be some problems. But I typically, once you get to 10,000 images in a project, you've really almost at that point in time gotten to a project size that is sufficient that is probably warrants maybe using a full size aircraft rather than a drone and flying a full size aircraft at a higher altitude and a larger sensor with then be fewer images and you can still process those with Pix40 then. <clears throat> and see here, Mavic Air 2. There's a lot of folks uh, who say the Mavic go, Air go, 2. Aaron, go back oh, one. Yes, sir. Uh, are, uh, Pix40, Pix4D okay. works on top of DJI Go 4. You fire up DJI Go and then Pix4D. Yeah, let's explain that a little bit more. Okay, so that's a great question. I apologize I overlooked that one. Thanks for bringing my attention back to it, Carrie. So really, you can only have one application controlling the drone at a time. And so you, PIX4D works in kind of conjunction with DJI GO 4, such that any kind of fail-safe battery settings you may have made in DJI GO 4, as far as tell me I got a low battery at 30% and come home at 20%, or hover in place if I lose connection with my signal, et cetera, those settings are respected and preserved, but you don't want both DJI Go 4 and Pix40 running at the same time because they both can't talk to the same drone. So I would go into DJI Go 4, make sure you have your fail-safe settings set up as far as what return to home is, what your return to home altitude is, etc. Then quit out of Go 4, start Pix4D, and then use that for your mission. The Mavic Now we're, we're talking about Pix4D capture versus Pix4D the processing engine. Those are two distinctly different products. That's a, Yes, that's exactly right. The Pix4D capture application is what you would have on your mobile device, on your iPhone or Android tablet, et cetera, and that's used for automating the flight, cap, flight capture, and that can, really shouldn't be run at the same time as DJI Go 4. Set your variables within Go 4 first, and then just run Pix4D capture, and then Pix4D mapper runs back on your desktop or laptop software and it's completely separate. And I'm a big fan of having multiple drones. I know that's self-serving working as a drone salesman, but really I, my first drone was a Sensefly EB, and then I got an Inspire 1, and then I got a Phantom 4, and I've just grown my fleet on and on. And really it's good to have drones of different sizes and shapes. The Mavic Air 2 is great for some projects, but you don't want to try to do a real big project with Mav Mavic Air 2. I mean, certainly you can make a map and model of your house with a Mavic Air 2, but I mean, that's something for small, enclosed flying where you want good detail and high resolution and on, under the eaves and things like that where you're flying in close and you just can't really fly a M300 or a Phantom 4 maybe quite in that tight confines. But certainly I wouldn't try to undertake any large projects with a Mavic Air 2. And I, I'm just not sure... My uh, have you seen if the SDK is even out for the Mavic Air 2 yet? Well, as far I as, even as know you know, the Mavic Air 2 is not supported by Pix4D Capture, but using that approach I talked about earlier of using the right. um, rule of thirds grid, you can capture data manually and get it to work, or even if you set it to do a image capture every like, one or two seconds as you fly the drone slowly, 
that could achieve the same goal, if you will. It's not fully automated. It takes a little bit more advanced knowledge to make it happen, but it's possible. Just received my Evo 2 Pro 6K. Congratulations. Will this be capable um, This be capable of mapping? Certainly, yes. I really like the Evo 2 Pro 6K for mapping. I just used it for the projects we were showing in the park earlier, and I think that's a great, um, great drone, George. I have ArcGIS on my desktop, computer that I use for work. Can you explain more about Pix40 and ArcGIS? So certainly, ArcGIS does have a great deal of image caping, processing capabilities built directly into it. They have um, a photogrammetry engine that, similar to Pix40 React, that'll process images that are from a native perspective. But overall, really, like they've created this um, drone, they have this solution called Drone 2 Map that they actually acquired when they purchased uh, 3D Robotics, or they purchased from 3D Robotics, actually. I guess 3D Robotics is still its own company. They just bought Drone Map from them. And that's essentially a Pix40 algorithm with a 3DR slash ArcGIS or Esri scan on top of it. And so it's using the same processing algorithm that is a standalone extension that you buy from Esri, and I believe that is roughly $1,500 a year. But then on top of that, you have to have, or you ultimately need to have ArcGIS Pro and other things to use along with that. Understood. So yes, can these maps overlay onto Google? So yes, one of the options within PIX4D while we're doing processing, if we look at our processing options here under the third step of processing, here um, when we talk about orthomosaic, DSM and orthomosaic, right here at the bottom, I can select Google Map Tiles and KML, and the software will actually generate these the output orthomosaic in a format that can be opened directly within um, Google Maps. Do keep in mind, though, that the way Google Maps is set up, that it's, Google Maps is designed to show Google data or Google Earth. And so when you zoom all the way in, a default pixel size in Google Earth is six inches. And so often you may not be able to zoom into the full resolution of your orthomosaic within Google because Google isn't really set up to show centimeter level accuracy imagery. But certainly you can show a slightly more coarse version of your orthomosaic output directly with Google. How can you calculate your the SD card memory for mapping jobs? Is there a chart for this? How will I know if I have enough storage space for certain jobs? Well, the best way to st do that is to always start with a blank SD card. In this instance here, I had borrowed a drone from the, the folks here at work and the SD card wasn't in it, so I just used one of the extra SD cards I carry in my wallet and that SD card had not been cared for properly in the past and I hadn't deleted information off of it when I was done with it last time, so that was a fault on mine. But typically I would always recommend that you start every mapping mission with a new SD card. And typically during a 20 to 40 minute drone flight, you really can't fill up a 16 gigabyte card. So if you just use a 16 gigabyte card to start with, I mean, you should be okay. Typically I use 32 gigabyte cards. It's not necessary to invest in 64 or 128 gigabyte cards because ultimately you don't want to just leave the card in the drone forever and you want to be swapping it out between missions so you can download the data, maybe have it start processing if you have a laptop with you in the field, et cetera, so you can do that field check. And so yeah, I'd focus on getting a whole bunch of 16 and 32 gigabyte cards and not worry about getting a real big card or something like that. It's what, it, what it's and doing right is taking JPEGs. And your JPEG images are pretty friggin' small. So if you actually wanted to calculate it, you could look at what size JPEGs your drone is creating. And then when you create the mission, it will tell you, uh, I mean, depending on the software, but generally it'll tell you how many photos it's going to take. And you could use some simple math to see exactly how much space that's going to take up. Yes, exactly. That's that's a good good point there, but it's all yeah always best to just start with an empty SD card. You really can't fill it up. In this case, I started with an SD card that I'd been using for a while and it was just in my wallet. And that was poor planning on my part. That was I failed my field logistics of making sure I had all my stuff together ahead of time. It happened. Excellent. Uh, well, I see here. Uh, actually, we, uh, George, got our, um, our started a little late. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, George is saying he picked up a 128 gig card. I do not recommend using 128 gig cards and drones. It is way too big. If you have a failure, you lose way too much data. They're more prone to corruption than smaller cards, and they're typically slower than smaller cards. 
So we, we don't even sell them here because it is hard to find good quality, high speed, 128 gig cards. We sell 32s and 64s because they work. Um, okay, that looks like the last of the questions there. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, sorry that we started a little late, so we went a little long, I guess. Uh, but really thank you all for joining. I uh, hope this was good for you. If you missed any of it, it will be, uh, it, this was recorded and we will have it up on our YouTube channel. You'll be able to, uh, you'll all be getting email links as to how to get that, um, probably late today or tomorrow morning. And I think that just about wraps it up. Bob's got, oh, I got one last question here. Uh, can you go through the details of how you get a mission plan for mapping? Um, you know, that's well, sure. the that's actual, yeah, go ahead. Well, I can address that. So I really, you just, I'm within the map planning software with the DJI, um, map pilot or the, um, pix d capture, you get a Google earth esque interface, very similar to what we see if we go here to the map view. And so just like you see this red polygon that's surrounding my project area, this is at the processing area I designed in this case. So within the map, the flight software, you would simply define a polygon like I have with this red box here and say, this is the area I'm looking to map. And then you specify your variables of what you want your front and side overlap to be. And the software comes up and does its own flight plan and comes up with the flight lines and you can orient them and adjust which or direction they're facing. If you don't want it to be like an east-west flight line, you can rotate it so it goes north-south. But it's really very straightforward and simple of clicking within a Google map type interface within the flight planning software. And if you go to YouTube and you type in Multicopter Warehouse, our channel will come up and go to videos. And just a, a few weeks ago, we did one, uh, a webinar called Mission, Mission Planning for aerial mapping. Uh, we go into some of it there. There's also one on uh, that was specific to the Autel uh, products, but that's a good one to watch because it does go through the interface and how you create those. Um, we do have quite a few recorded uh, webinars on our YouTube channel, and most of them lately have been on mapping. So if you want kind of a refresher or a primer on <laughs> mapping, definitely check out our YouTube channel and go to our webinars. Uh, there's quite a bit of information there. All right. Thanks, everybody. Really yeah, appreciate it. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Kerry. Yep. And uh, we'll wrap it up here.